We all need to invest. Nobody knows what the future holds, but a typical lifetime includes some pretty major expenses. There's housing, of course, and there are weddings, funerals, operations, holidays, children's education, and cars. But most important of all, there's retirement. The average lifespan in the United States has risen to around 78.6 years. The number of Americans who are 100 years old or older hit a record in 2017 and continues to grow. People leaving work today will typically spend 20 years or more in retirement. That's a very long time to last without a regular salary. So how should we invest? How do we give ourselves the very best chance of achieving our financial goals? At the very least, how do we ensure that we don't run out of money before we die and end up relying on loved ones or the state for financial support? Historically, the biggest investment returns have come from owning shares in companies or equities. A team from London Business School has carried out a detailed study into the performance of different asset classes around the world since 1900. It found that over the long term, shares are the runaway winner. Their findings are summarised in a book called Triumph of the Optimists. If you plot through the history, using the work that I've done with my London Business School colleagues, uh, Paul Marsh and Mike Staunton, where we've looked at the performance of individual stock markets, we've now got data for 23 different markets running from 1900 with data up to 2015. Some of those markets prospered uh, on the way in a direction that was largely going upwards and onwards, although there were some setbacks. We called it Triumph of the Optimists because our view was that back in 1900, only real optimists would have poured their money into industrial and commercial common stocks, and that many risk-averse investors would have played safe with government securities. It was the optimists, the people who were not frightened, who, d who performed very well. So let's look at the figures for the US. According to Professor Dimpson and his team, between 1900 and the end of 2017, cash delivered an annualised real return, in other words, adjusted for the effects of inflation, of 0.8%. Bonds returned 2.0%. But stocks produced an average annual return of 6.5%. You could if you wanted, invest all your money yourself in individual stocks. But the transaction costs incurred would be considerable. It would also be very time consuming monitoring the performance of all the stocks in your portfolio. The vast majority of investors give their money to professional stock pickers who actively manage their money for them. Mark Hebner is a financial advisor and investment author based in California. So active investing has to do with an investment strategy where an individual or a fund manager is trying to beat a market. I say a market because there are many different markets in this world, international, US, even bond markets. And so they try to engage in different strategies such as picking stocks, trying to time the market, trying to select managers who will do one of those things and beat uh, the market. And lastly, trying to choose an investment style that they think will have the best return at some near-term future. In essence, it's speculation versus investing, and it's actually a very bad idea because we have mountains of evidence that says that none of those things actually work. One of the most detailed studies of active fund performance was conducted by a team led by Professor David Blake at the Pensions Institute. Its findings show that after costs, only a tiny proportion of active managers outperform over the long term. Well, the evidence shows, both for the UK and the US, if we're talking about mutual funds in particular, that a very small proportion, around about 1%, outperform in the long term on a risk and cost-adjusted basis. So 99% of fund managers uh, uh, deliver negative value added for their consumers once you take into account the fees that they charge. 
Another problem active investors face is that a large proportion of funds are what are called closet trackers. In other words, although they claim to be actively managed, they broadly track the whole market. After costs, they're almost guaranteed to underperform. To beat the market, an active manager has to show conviction. But they're just as likely to be wrong as they are to be right. And just because they've been right in the past, that doesn't mean they'll continue to be right in the future. Distinguishing genuine skill from pure luck is extremely difficult. If you put a large number of monkeys on a large number of typewriters for a large amount of time, one of them will type out to be or not to be. But you don't necessarily hire that monkey to write your next play. I mean, my work, which applies to partly to the US, sometimes to the UK and also to Germany, suggests about 70% of funds are just closet trackers. So you're paying them a fee for something that you could really do yourself. About 20% your grandma could do better than them, so they actually uh, remove value. And about 5% uh, probably are skilled managers. But having said that, you know, they are probably harder to find than the Higgs boson. The findings of Professors Blake and Cuthbertson are backed up by SPIVA, the S&P Index versus Active Scorecard. SPIVA confirms that most managers underperform most of the time and that persistent outperformance is extremely rare. Period by period, year by year, we look at the top quartile of managers and we see how many of those top quartile managers were top quartile the year after, the year after, or the year after. Um, and what we found there is, I'm afraid, bad news for the believers in, in, in the hope that the past uh, is a guide to the future. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it's even worse than you might hope. So the chance of, uh, historically, of a manager remaining in the top quartile for five consecutive years is actually quite a bit worse than the chance of getting heads uh, five times in a row. This all begs the question, why do active funds generally perform so poorly? Well, the central problem is that active management is a zero-sum game. For one manager to win, another has to lose. And because the fund industry has mushroomed in size, it's become increasingly difficult for a single manager to outperform his peers consistently. The problem for most people, I think, is they just don't recognize, not paying attention to, how very many people there are who use the same kind of computers, have access to the same kind of staff, have Mike Bloomberg's wonderful system for gathering data and information any way you want it, use the same securities analysis and same securities research, get the same information from all the companies because regulators require it, so that they're par equal, par equal, par equal, par equal, and a whole bunch of different really important factors that 50, 40, 30 years ago really differentiated the winners from the others. But now it's not a differentiation because everybody has it. Another question you might be asking is why do so many investors continue to use actively managed funds in the face of all this evidence that after fees and charges, only a tiny number of them actually beat the market? One reason is that the active fund industry is extremely lucrative and firms have huge budgets to spend on PR and advertising. Another reason is that all sorts of financial intermediaries have done very well out of active management and have therefore had little incentive to point out to investors what a poor deal they've received for many years. Thankfully for those investors, there are alternatives. You hear? OK, I'll be straight out. One of the biggest developments in the investing industry in recent years has been the growing popularity of passive investing. Instead of paying to have their money actively managed, investors are increasingly opting to put it into index funds, which are very much cheaper, and aim to capture the returns of an entire market by tracking an index.
The term passive investing, I think it's actually, it's not a very good term for most people to understand because it sounds like you're standing in the corner or you're not participating or you're somehow missing out. And, and that's bringing, uh, that evokes emotions, negative emotions. I like to call, uh, rather than call it passive investing, I call it smart investing, the kind of no regrets investing where I've minimised the moving parts, I've minimised the decisions I have to make, I've minimised the cost and I've maximised the chance of me getting the returns from capitalism which are there for the taking. A, um, a passive portfolio can go down just as well as it can go up and uh, people talk about when stock markets are racing, that's great, but what about when they fall? Well, active funds fall, if, if not the same, if not more, because of the bets that they're taking. But I think rather than use the word passive, that's use the word smart, smart investing. And what is smart investing? Smart investing is minimising the moving parts and maximising the chance and the amount that you're going to get from participating as an investor in capitalism. The case for passive investing is based on two related theories, the random walk and the efficient market hypothesis. The random walk hypothesis is really crucial for investors to understand. It in essence says that the current price includes all the information we currently know and actually the impact of that information on the future. So the change in price in the future has to do with new information that is random and unpredictable. Nobody knows tomorrow's news. So efficient markets has to do again with this idea that all the known information and news is currently embedded in the stock market prices. And the real implication of that is that prices are fair. If you agree that markets are mostly efficient and that future price movements are unpredictable, index funds are the logical choice. But the biggest advantage of using them is the cost. You can buy an index fund for around 20 basis points. That's another way of saying a fifth of 1%. For an actively managed fund, you're looking at an annual charge of between 75 and 100 basis points. But once you add on transaction costs and other fees and charges, you could be paying at least 200 basis points. In other words, 10 times more expensive than an index fund. Over the course of an investing lifetime, that can make a huge difference. Every penny you pay in costs, um, that comes out of your return reduces the impact of compounding. And initially, what might seem a small amount coming out of your money each, um, each year actually has a disproportionate impact on the end result that you're going to have. Now, in some cases, if you're paying, say, 1% per annum to someone to manage your money and you've got a compound return of, say, 5%, it could make the difference between having four million pounds at the end of the term, and three million pounds. I mean, you can choose your term, you can choose your investment amount, you can choose your investment return. But the point is, is that small deductions from your money on an ongoing basis actually have a massive impact on the end terminal value that you'll end up with. In the US in particular, there've been huge outflows of money from actively managed funds and into low cost index funds. In the UK too, more and more investors are now choosing to take the passive route as concern grows about the performance of active managers and the industry's unwillingness to introduce lower, more transparent fees for active funds. Some in the industry have warned that indexing is becoming too popular but that's not a concern shared by Ben Johnson, Director of Passive Funds Research at Morningstar. You look at the growth of, of passive investing, it's clear why these, these concerns have been raised because passive investing index funds, exchange traded funds have been growing at a, a, a pace that has far outstripped the growth, which has actually in some cases been attrition of traditional actively managed funds. Now that said, these are by definition very low activity managed funds. So the, the real concern should be 
who is doing price setting at the margin? Does it continue to be well-informed, well-equipped active managers, or is it just passive funds that are blindly buying securities that are setting out to, to track the index? These low activity, low turnover funds are actually doing a very tiny fraction of the actual trading in securities markets, which is where actual price discovery is taking place, where prices are being set. Finally, what does Warren Buffett, probably the most famous investor of all, make of index funds? The answer is he loves them. In his February 2017 letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders, Buffett was hugely critical of active managers, hedge fund managers in particular, and of the fees they charge. Both large and small investors, he said, should stick with low-cost index funds. So far, we've looked at two different types of investing. On the one hand, there's active investing, actively trying to beat the market through stock selection and market timing. This is often referred to in the industry as trying to generate alpha. On the other hand, there's passive investing, simply trying to capture market returns, often referred to as beta, at a much lower cost. But there is a third way a sort of halfway house between active and passive. It's called factor investing. Sometimes referred to as smart, strategic or alternative beta, factor investing is based on the multi-factor model developed by two American academics, the Nobel laureate Eugene Farmer and his colleague Kenneth French. The multi-factor model took the equity returns of stocks and carve them up into slices, basically looking at the size of the companies and a, uh, a value growth metric. And so by dividing up the market into these slices and looking at the returns of these different slices, academics and primarily Fama and French uh, uncovered that there are higher, there had been higher returns among small companies and among value companies. And then when you blended that, you even had a, a, a combination of these factors for even higher returns. So the original Pharma French multi-factor model included three types of risk, market risk, the size factor, and the value factor. They later added profitability. In other words, more profitable companies tend to deliver higher returns over time. Academics have also identified two primary factors driving fixed income or bond returns. The first is term premium, that is, bonds with distant future dates have returned more than bonds that are due soon. And the second is credit premium, i.e. bonds with lower credit ratings have returned more than bonds with higher credit ratings. We don't think that investors are suddenly going to stop demanding differences in expected returns to hold different stocks. It's, uh, we think it's very unlikely that every stock in the world will have the same expected return at some point in the future. Unless that happens, you're always going to have size, value, profitability premiums. But what changes how you go about identifying who's low relative price and how you go about identifying who has high expected cash flows. And those things evolve as accounting practices evolve, as data evolves, as you get better and better data. Those things evolve, but the underlying principle of the three-factor model and the five-factor model, which has been around for hundreds of years and will be around for hundreds of years in markets. Seeking exposure to different risk factors is known as tilting your portfolio. So are factor tilts a good idea? Factor-based funds are slightly more expensive than conventional index funds, but if you're willing to be patient, then yes, they can make sense. What you have to remember about these different factors is that although they are expected to deliver higher returns, there is a price to pay in the form of greater risk. Many investors are simply too impatient. They expect outperformance far more quickly than is reasonable. Any of the smart beta strategies um, work on their own over a reasonable period of time. But to think that you're going to beat the market over a one, two, three year period 
is really misunderstanding what the products do. So if you can build a portfolio that you could stick to, that's probably more important than the strategy itself, whether you want to equal weight them, tilt to value to, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. But I think one of the issues is that people that had been chasing the mutual fund managers might experience similar behavior with these smart beta products. So I think that's sort of, that therein lies the danger. Some say there's another danger, that factor investing is becoming too popular. As more and more people tilt to different factors, might the premiums that those factors are expected to deliver disappear? So what you could very well see is, is a form of an observer effect, whereby people crowd into, say, the value factor through one or multiple funds that set out to exploit that value factor. And by doing so, they squeeze out any excess performance that might have existed in there. Now, ultimately, what I think you will see is that behavior will take hold, that people are still people, and that newly minted value investors will get fed up with market-like or subpar performance. They will go out of that fund or that factor as quickly as they entered it, and value will magically reappear. So, when deciding how to invest, the most important thing is to avoid high-cost, actively managed funds. The evidence clearly shows that the best approach is a combination of passive investing and factor investing, sometimes known as evidence-based investing. By choosing the evidence-based route, you're far more likely to have a successful investment experience. There's no getting away from the fact that whatever investment strategy you choose, it's bound to involve at least a degree of risk. People are generally much happier talking about returns, but it's essential before you make any investment decision that you fully understand any risk you might be taking. Risk and return are in fact directly related to each other. The returns you receive are a reward for the risk you take. No, that doesn't mean that taking risk guarantees a positive return, otherwise it wouldn't be a risk at all. But you can't expect your money to grow unless you're prepared to accept the possibility that you might lose money, at least in the short term. This relationship between risk and return has to do with the uncertainty of the return and then the price that a willing buyer is willing to pay based on that uncertainty. So let's assume uh, I have an investment that uh, we would expect to earn 10% a year and you want to buy that from me. One of the first things you want to know is how certain is that 10%. And the more risk or uncertainty associated with that 10%, the lower the price that you would be willing to pay for that investment. There are actually several different types of risk involved in investing, not the least of which is that you don't take enough risk. The main risk for most people is the failure to achieve their desired lifestyle and other important goals. That's the number one risk that you need to be thinking of and everything has to be judged in relation to that. If you can achieve all your goals by leaving all your money in cash under, under cautious assumptions, then why bother investing? But most people in the real world haven't got overfunded pensions, haven't got more cash than they need, haven't, haven't got quite enough, or don't want to save enough, or don't want to continue working until they're 100. So for those people, the risk for them is that they're going to live beyond their capital, and or that inflation is going to erode the purchasing power of their capital, um, or that taxes or some other catastrophe is going to destroy their wealth and, and take their wealth from them. But there are other risks as well. There are, there's risks that you, you know, you've got your money invested in something or in a bank account or in investments, and, and there's a fraud and someone runs off of your money, or there's a failure of a financial institution. That's called counterparty risk. Um, and then the other risk, of course, is that you've got um, illiquid funds but you need to spend them and you can't get your hands on them in which case that will force you to actually borrow money and pay someone a premium for doing so. One of the biggest risks investors face is market risk. In other words, the risk that the market will fall heavily and that you need to access your money before it recovers. 
but market volatility is part and parcel of investing in the stock market. Assuming your time horizon is long enough, you shouldn't really see it as risk at all. What is the chance of a permanent loss of capital from investing in quoted markets? It would probably be nuclear war, an asteroid um, situation, or some other massive calamity, in, in, which, in which case all bets are off. Okay? So just because something is possible doesn't mean it's probable. The probability of a permanent loss of capital from investing in major markets is very, very, very low over the medium to long term. And by that I mean 20 years plus. The possibility and probability of you having a 30% fall in value over the next two to three years is probably one in three. Another common type of risk is being too concentrated. Even in a bull market, the price of an individual stock can fall sharply. And when the wider economy is thriving, a company or even a country can still default on a bond. You can avoid concentration risk by having a diversified portfolio. Reducing the chance of your overall investments underperforming or losing money. Take the example 20 years ago that you had invested in just one market. If you had picked the right market, that would have been great. If you had picked the market that was in vogue at the time, namely Japan, you would have lost 75 or 80 percent of your money. If you had picked the whole world, which is what I advocate doing, um, you would have diversified the risk away of being unlucky in picking just one country, in this case Japan. Avoiding concentration risk is not the only benefit of diversification. Staying diversified will create a smoother ride towards your goals. Picture three jagged lines, representing three different kinds of asset. If you were to hold just one of those assets in your portfolio, you could expect a bumpy ride. But if you bundle the three together, the ups and downs are much less pronounced. One reason for this is that when one type of asset zigs, another often zags. Equities and bonds, for example, are, broadly speaking, negatively correlated. Ultimately, risk is a very personal matter. A portfolio that seems cautious to one investor can be highly risky to another. No investor should take more risk than they need to take, they can afford to take, or they feel comfortable taking. And whatever your own capacity for risk, it's vital to ensure that your portfolio is diversified. Thank you. So far, we've looked at three different types of investing. First, the evidence shows you should avoid using actively managed funds altogether. So what should you use? Well, either passively managed funds or funds that are designed to capture the returns of specific risk factors. Or indeed, a combination of the two. We've also seen the importance of matching your portfolio to your capacity for risk. Ultimately though, whether or not you succeed as an investor is essentially up to you. The way that they behave, particularly in the presence of money, isn't what anybody would expect. It's irrational. Uh, because in essence people behave in ways that mean that they lose money. And you can predict that they'll lose money because of the way that they're actually behaving. So this gap between what you would expect people to do rationally and what they actually do when they're put in the situation of finance and money and investment and risk and uncertainty, there's this hole. Some studies have shown three to four percent a year is being dropped by investors purely because of making poor buying and selling decisions. Now that's just one bias. That's just one type of issue that they're facing. So you know, if people are consistently making mistakes in terms of when they buy and when they sell stocks, over a lifetime, that's thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds. And you scale that up across the industry, 
It's billions of pounds a year. Thank you. It's because the returns you end up with are so dependent on your behaviour that self-awareness is so important. Understanding your own personality, what your goals are and what biases you're particularly prone to will help you to manage that behaviour in the years to come. You have to know your own temperament, uh, your own appetite for risk, your own ability to overreact in highly emotional situations. Every investor needs to know that about themselves and they kind of lay on a framework of investing that fits that personality. If you are a highly emotional person who's susceptible to the big ups and downs of the markets, having a pretty conservative investment style is the right way to go for you. And I think a lot of investors try to uh, manage around optimizing down to the basis point. What's the best portfolio for me to own? And then in 2009, the market falls 50% and they're out and they're panicked. And at that point, all the optimization that you did before it doesn't matter anymore. So if you can nail down the behavioral aspect of investing, all of the optimization that we layer on top of that matters less and less. It's not that it doesn't matter, it's just of less importance than other aspects of investing. A constant temptation investors face is to try to time the market, but it's almost impossible to do successfully. Between the two world wars, the bursar of King's College, Cambridge, and the man responsible for the college's investment strategy was the famous economist John Maynard Keynes. He tried to get into the market when prices were about to rise and out again before they fell. But even Keynes missed the most infamous market crash of all. Keynes uh, ran uh, portfolios both for himself and for his college amongst other investors for about a quarter of a century. And uh, one of the key things that he learned about investing was the great difficulty or indeed the futility of market timing. So by market timing, what we mean is trying to pick the points when you should be in or out of the equity market uh, as opposed to being in bonds or cash, for example, because those were the three major asset classes that were available to him in addition to property. Uh, in the uh, 20s and the 30s. He poured over economic and industrial statistics and indeed he founded the premier economic and statistical service of its day. Despite all those advantages, as well as being a great economist, he found it very difficult to time when to get in and when to get out of the equity market. And probably the prime example of that is that in October 1929, when the London stock market crashed, uh, along with New York, he was very still very heavily into equities. You'll often see supposed experts speculating in the media about the likely impact on the markets of major political events like elections and referendums. But almost invariably, the best thing to do at times like these is to leave your portfolio exactly as it is. Political events are very difficult to predict in advance. You know, a couple in particular, Brexit, Trump, a few months before that, they were completely um, off, off the radar. But what's really interesting is, even if you had been able to predict some of these events in advance, being able to predict how the markets were going to respond to those events when, once they happened was also very difficult. So we saw, for example, in the UK that markets didn't collapse, the stock market didn't collapse after the Brexit vote, the, the currency did actually, but stock markets didn't. In the US, we actually saw the opposite, the, the stock market started to surge on, on the expectation of some expansionary policies. And again, most investors, even so-called informed investors, wouldn't have been positioned for that. If I want a real stream of income that's diversified, and for the long term, equities are quite a good thing to be invested in. You, you take a risk coming out, you take a risk going in that you know better than anybody else, and throwing that dice will cost me several percent, of which I'll only know about a very small part of it. All the rest will be in transaction costs. So again, start with fundamentals, stick with the fundamentals, and you're likely to do an awful lot better than people that are trying to switch in and out all of the time.
In fact, human beings are hardwired to make poor investment decisions. When markets soar, the reflexive nucleus accumbens fires up at the back of the brain's frontal lobe, and we instinctively want to buy. But when markets tumble, our brain's amygdala floods our bloodstream with corticosterone. Fear kicks in, and we're overwhelmed by the urge to sell. Indeed, it's during a crash or market correction that investors tend to make their biggest mistakes. So how should you react? A lot of that is about looking inward. What is your risk tolerance? Do you has anything changed in terms of your knowledge about the markets and your ability to outperform the markets? In overwhelming likelihood, is no. Whatever, whether it's now March two thousand and nine, and you've lost half your money, you still can't outperform the markets. You still can't know what's going to happen twelve months hence. But that doesn't mean that the decline hasn't altered your circumstances. It might paradoxically be that, as a result of a great loss, you have a lesser tolerance for risk. That's a personal thing, and you should treat it as that. Stock markets have always been subject to periods of extreme volatility, and always will be. You can't be sure how you're going to react until you find yourself in just that sort of situation. The important thing is to be prepared. Understand how markets work, understand your plan, but most important of all, understand yourself. The biggest threat to your success as an investor is you. Our search for the truth about investing is almost at an end. Now you might be thinking you know enough now to manage your finances on your own, but everyone can benefit from good financial advice, even those who understand investing inside out. I use a financial planner, even though I've got all the experience in the world and I don't need them to run money because I value them helping me articulate what I need to do, helping me keep help me to account for the things that I say are important, and also being there. If anything happens to me, my wife knows the number to call、um, to help her. Of utmost importance is understanding how an advisor adds value. When it comes to investing your money, there's a strong case for having an expert on your side. There's this rich field of academic finance that has been developed over 50, 60 plus years, and it's complex, it's deep, and it takes a lot of expertise to understand. It's just like medicine. Why do you have a medical doctor? Because they have expertise. They've dedicated their lives to understanding something that most people haven't dedicated their lives to understanding, and they can provide you valuable services that can give you a better. Experience because they're keeping abreast of all that medical research, all those advances in medicine. It's the same thing when it comes to financial advice. One of the most important ways in which an advisor adds value is by acting as a behavioural coach, helping the investor to control their emotions and to avoid making mistakes. We actually went back and looked at over six hundred and fifty clients. Who invested、uh, with us over a seven-year time period, from before the 2008 crash、uh, up till 2014, and we were quite surprised to see when we divided those clients into a couple buckets: those who basically followed our advice, and those who didn't follow our advice but actually stayed here at the firm, so we could actually track how well they did. What we discovered is those clients. Who basically stuck with the program, the passive investing program? They are actually earned the full return of the original index portfolio they were advised to invest in. But then the group who decided to kind of go on their own, sort of the rogue client, if you will, and、uh, were concerned about the market, so they went to cash. Then they decided when was the right time to come in, and they basically decided they wanted to take over their portfolio. We put them in another bucket, 
And there, I think there was 156 of those clients out of the 650. And what we found is they only, only earned 70% of the return of the original portfolio they had elected to be at. So that was a 30% cost to them by not sticking with the advice of an advisor. But a word of warning. Investors must ensure that the advisor they choose is a fiduciary who genuinely puts the interests of their clients ahead of their own. A fiduciary is somebody who has an obligation and a duty to do what's in the best interest of the other party, even if it goes against their interest. And what's so surprising to so many investors is that a broker working at a brokerage firm actually has an exclusion for being a fiduciary to their clients. But a registered investment advisor has a duty to do what's in the best interest of their clients and to avoid conflicts of interest that might set them up to do something that wouldn't be in the best interest of the client. So, however tempted you are to do it all yourself, it pays to have an objective expert with your very best interests at heart. And when I say it pays, I mean it pays. Research by Vanguard Asset Management has shown that a good advisor can add an average of about 3% a year to your net investment returns. Vanguard calls this Advisor Alpha. Over the course of your investing lifetime, Advisor Alpha can add up to a very substantial sum of money. I have a financial advisor all around tax planning, uh, estate planning, uh, all the different types of wealth planning that most people don't spend a lot of time gaining the expertise to be really good at. And so uh, you can really have a, a better overall experience across all aspects of your financial health through working with an advisor. So, to summarise, you are far more likely to achieve your financial goals with the help of an advisor. But beware of advisors who see themselves as investment managers, who claim to be able to beat the market. Choose an advisor who believes in proper financial planning. And yes, of course, one whose investment philosophy is based on hard evidence.